Here we are, in fact, live. Uh, so, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's NHSR uh, webinar. My name is um, Alex Lawless. I'm one of the healthcare analysts at the Strategy Unit, um, working very closely with the NHSR community and um, a few of the big wigs and that side of things. So, I'm just here to um, to host this month's webinar. Some of you might remember that I did last month. So. Um, luckily for you, I'm not doing it again. We've got someone much better and much more interesting this month, so I'll fairly quickly pass over to her. Just wanted to let you all aware, make you all aware of, kind of who we are and, and that's sort of where we can be found. Um, I imagine most people are fairly um, familiar with the you NHSR know, community and what we're trying to do, um, but if not, just to let you know, obviously it's almost solely around promoting the, the use of R in the NHS. Uh, this is kind of done through various um, training courses, webinars um, and, uh, and annual conferences um, that are actually, I think it's coming up this October, I think, maybe it's November. Stay tuned for that. Um, also, do kind of engage with us on uh, these various social media uh, platforms. We're always open to um, new speakers and, and kind of new information from for anyone who's interested. Similarly, Hexi time is worth checking out as well, where we can um, engage each other on, on, on kind of our use of R and how we can that, that can be improved. Um, this is recording um, and a, a video will be available, I think, via the, the link that you access this webinar and also via our YouTube channel. Um, and just to let you make you aware of up and coming um, webinars, we've also got, as, it, as, as is in the name, one every month. Next month is from uh, Michael Campbell's where we're looking at um, simple statistics using R. It's also hyper applicable to all of our various work streams. I think that's all I need to I need to say at the moment. Um, I'll quickly hand over to Anna to put a bit more uh, introduce herself in more depth, but um, for now I'll leave you to it. OK, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm just going to share my slides and I will be off. Um, oh. Um, nope. Yeah, there we go. Um, OK, fantastic. So thanks for the introduction and I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Um, so my name is Anna Heath. I'm a, a scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Um, and faculty at the University of Toronto in biostatistics. Um, as you may be able to tell, I'm, I'm a, not <laughs> originally from Toronto. I'm originally um, from the UK and uh, I did my PhD at UCL before moving out here. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today um, about how I use R in kind of my research to do to design um, adaptive clinical trials. Um, so just before I kind of start, I just wanted to say thanks to kind of all my collaborators. So for those of you who work in clinical trials or see clinical trials, they're very much not a single person um, enterprise. And so uh, the list of people there are primarily the clinicians that kind of I work with or other statisticians that really help. So this is really like a group effort, but I'm hoping to kind of show how we kind of use R to do the design and um, Eventually, we'll be using R to do the analysis of the trials, but actually both these trials are still um, recruiting, so it's mostly it's going to be focusing primarily on the design. Um, I think I'm happy to take questions um, throughout the presentation, so um, I think there's like a chat box that you can put them in and then um, I'll be interrupted. <laughs> Um, so yeah, without further ado, I will um, start. So just to give like a really, really brief introduction, um, which hopefully um, many of you will know. So clinical trials are essentially, the goal of a clinical trial is just to assess the safety and or the efficacy of healthcare interventions in humans. Um, so they really uh, kind of go over like a huge spectrum of different studies with the goal to just assess maybe the safety as you start in the kind of early phase clinical trials, going forward to assessing kind of efficacy, dose uh, dose findings, so trying to work out the best dose for the interventions all the way through to kind of these big phase three trials where you would do um, uh, like, you know, two interventions, placebo control, um, 
and really try and demonstrate the efficacy of the of a new intervention in maybe thousands or even tens of thousands of, of patients. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about two kind of different trials. The first one's going to be a dose finding study, so much more kind of early on in the kind of drug development stage. And then one which is a, a confirmatory trial, so a phase three trial where we're really trying to tell what's the optimal kind of intervention from two um, kind of proposed settings. Um, the other part, I guess, of my talk today is about adaptive trials. So just to talk, I think adaptive trials are, are kind of used in lots of different um, spaces, but basically the main kind of overriding kind of concept of an adaptive trial is that in a standard trial, what you would do is you would do the design phase. So that would be kind of working with the statisticians, working with um, the clinicians to kind of just determine the design. And at that point, we kind of fix the design. So we say, OK, we're going to enroll 200 patients and we're going to collect these outcomes. We would then conduct the trial kind of independently um, and then we would analyze the data. In an adaptive design, you have the same kind of key three phases, but the key point is that during the conduct phase of the trial, you use the data that you've accumulated in the trial so far to you kind of review that data and you react to that data. So you maybe change the conduct of the trial as you're going through the trial based on the data that you um, that you collect. Um, so there are many different types of adaptation. There's many different types of uh, ways that you can change these trials. And actually, this is, isn't even necessarily an exhaustive lift, list, but like a lot of the key things are things like refining the trial sample size. So you might do a kind of pilot phase of the trial where you try to see what the standard deviation of the kind of key primary outcome is. And after you've collected 30 patients, you just use that to refine the final trial sample size. Or it may be something that's much more um, sophisticated, so that really, you know, looks at the data in tranches of 10 to 20 patients and tries to refine the sample size at each point. You can also change like the treatment allocation or the doses that you give in the trial. So you might say, oh, we're going to, you know, keep analyzing the data to work out whether this treatment is still relevant or we're going to give increasing doses as we go through the trial and try and work out the best dose. You can actually uh, think about stopping the whole trial for efficacy or futility. So after, you know, looking at the data at interim points, we can say, is the new treatment that we're trying to assess, is it actually you know, so efficacious that we should just stop investigating now or vice versa? There's so little evidence of efficacy that we should stop for futility and kind of save resources. You can change the allocation of patients. So you might change how many patients receive each treatment. So the randomization ratios or you might change who those patients are, for example. Uh, so focusing on patients who have a greater potential to benefit, maybe based on a biomarker or um, like some kind of evidence that you, you get from the trial that this population would be something that would be better to focus on. You can also seamlessly move between trial phases. So that might be where you start with a kind of small phase, phase two trial, which does look at efficacy, but primarily focuses on safety. And you're looking to see whether there's good evidence to move from that kind of exploratory phase two into a confirmatory phase three and somehow use the data from phase two in the phase three analysis. So that can make the trials shorter, more efficient. And of course, you can combine any of these adaptations. So you might have something that changes the treatment allocation throughout the trial, but also at each interim analysis would stop and have a look for efficacy and check for futility. Um, so as I said, this isn't necessarily exhaustive, but these are the kind of key things that we talk about when we're talking about adaptive trials. And I think to my mind, the, the, the interesting thing about these these trials and the statistically what's interesting about these trials is that for a fixed design, there's sort of only one design you can do. You know, you have a you do the design, it's fixed and then you go forward in an adaptive design. You actually have so many different ways that kind of so many different adaptations that fall under this umbrella that you actually get a lot more like flexibility and statistically you, you need to be involved in that um, analysis. So why do we think about using adaptive designs? Um, so often they're spoken about as being more ethical. 
Um, so you kind of stop recruitment for futile arms or even futile trials. Um, and you that means that you don't expose patients to drugs that are clearly not obvious based on the data that you're bringing in into the trial at that point. They can be more efficient, so you actually require fewer patients kind of on average across all the trials for the same level of accuracy. So that would be if you have a, a, a trial that's obviously beneficial, then you would actually stop that earlier. Um, and that means that it's these trials are often can be faster. And so because of this quicker recruitment, more efficient recruitment, you can actually get to faster approvals. So not only do you finish the trial faster, but you get the, the drug into patients, into general use faster. Um, they can be more informative as well because they allow you to kind of focus more quickly on questions or populations that are relevant for decision making. So maybe it becomes very obvious early on that there's a specific subpopulation that isn't benefiting from the treatment. You can really like drop those and focus on the, the populations that are relevant. And they often um, save resources because you can kind of prevent waste on trials that have a low chance of success and you can really focus on the, the, the trials that are more um, that are more likely to yield benefit. So um, to talk a bit about kind of formally, I guess, statistical adaptive design. Um, so the FDA in, the, in America defines an adaptive design as a clinical trial design that allows for prospectively planned modifications to one or more aspects of the design based on accumulating data from subjects in the trial. So there's kind of two key um, parts that I've really highlighted here. So firstly, an adaptive design is a clinical trial that prospectively de decides what the modifications are going to be in the trial. So it's not something where you just kind of look at the data like willy nilly and you see what's going to happen. You have to really decide before you do the study how you're going to adapt the trial in the face of the data. Um, so usually this comes in the form of kind of decision rules. So we say like we're going to um, drop an arm, a futile arm, if there's a chance or yeah, there's a very small chance that it's eff um, effective. And uh, that that chance, that threshold, so small chance, has to be defined before the trial to say be 5%. That would be something that you've kind of prospectively um, decided. And what you have to do um, kind of in order to determine that prospective um, modification, you have to do this kind of key statistical adaptive design um, component, which basically focuses on these three things. So statistical trial design essentially determines which adaptations will be made and what is the impact of these adaptations on the trial and its analysis methods. So we need to make sure that we have kind of good, what we call good control of error rates. So clinical trials typically focus on kind of controlling error. So we want to make sure that we have a high chance of concluding the drug is effective if it is effective, which is called, I guess, type two error. Um, and you also want um, a good control of the type one error, which is if there is no effect, you don't conclude that it's effective very often. Um, and adaptive trials also need to have this control of error rates. Um, so we need to basically make sure before we go forward with the trial that if there's no um, effect, do we still have good control of that error rate, even though we're doing this ad adaptations. Um, in statistical trial design, we need to determine the decision rules for the trial adaptations. So we need to make them explicit. We need to you know, really make sure we know exactly what they are and again, what that impact is on the error rates of the trial and what that impact is on the final analysis of the trial. Um, at the end of the trial, um, you may also need to adjust your analysis to, uh, to accurately um, estimate the parameters. So, for example, if you stop, um, if you decide that you're going to stop a trial because it's the drug is effective, um, you will often have a um, you will essentially have a biased estimate of your kind of key parameter in the study because there'll be occasionally you would stop the trial early, even though there's no effect. And that would lead you to kind of um, bias the, the parameter estimate upwards. 
So in order to make these adjustments and in order to determine the impact of um, the kind of adaptations on the trial characteristics, we often require um, trial simulations. So that's where we kind of run the, the fake trial, as it were, multiple times um, and use that to understand the what's happening in the trial. And we undertake or I undertake these uh, trial simulations in R. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to be using a couple of um, trial examples and demonstrate how we use R to kind of undertake these trial simulations and understand how these adaptive trials work in the real world. OK, so I'm just going to quickly uh, stop there. I don't know if there are any questions on that introductory section. Uh, nothing um, so far. OK, perfect. Um, so I don't I don't know how many people have uh, been using Bayesian methods or seen Bayesian methods, but Bayesian methods um, are a kind of statistical inference framework um, that really go hand in hand with adaptive trials. And the reason for that is because um, if you use um, a Bayesian analysis, you don't need to adjust your analysis for the fact that you've had multiple looks at the data. So in a kind of standard frequentist method, if you look at the data as the trial is going on, so say four times, you need to adjust your final analysis for the fact that you've done kind of multiple testing throughout the trial. Whereas in a Bayesian framework, you don't have to make those adjustments um, simply because um, Bayesian methods, um, which I kind of have demonstrated on the on the left hand side, um, what they tend to do is that, well, the kind of framework behind a Bayesian method is you start with a prior, which represents your current beliefs. So that's the black dashed line on the on the plot. Um, and then the data form a likelihood. So that's the pink dotted line, which I can see is quite faint. So hopefully you can see that. Um, and the Bayesian analysis essentially just combines the prior, so the black line and the pink, the pink line into a posterior, which is the blue line. And it doesn't matter whether you do that updating between the prior with the prior and the likelihood in one step or multiple steps, you still get the same posterior. So it doesn't matter whether you just wait till the end of the trial and do all of your update in one go or whether you update the, the posterior multiple times throughout the trial, you'll still get the same posterior. So we tend to do or we tend to make use of Bayesian methods in um, adaptive design um, a lot. And then so this is, I guess, kind of a very brief introduction <laughs> to Bayesian statistics. Um, but even in these Bayesian trials, um, what we often are trying to use is simulations to assess the error rates from both a frequentist and a Bayesian perspective. So what we're looking for is good control of this type one and type two error, even in the situations where we're using Bayesian methods in our trials. Um, so for if, if you have used Bayesian methods before, what you'll know is that you often require kind of specialist Bayesian software. So it's not something that you can do kind of directly in R, but we combine R with um, other programs um, such as JAGS or STAN um, in order to do these designs. So essentially what this means is that within R, we're going to run the simulations, but within this specialized Bayesian software, we will be essentially doing this updating. So in the Bayesian software, you're combining the prior and the likelihood to estimate the posterior. But within R, we are kind of running the simulated trials. So we're using R to simulate the data, the fake, the fake data from the trials, and we're using JAGS and STAN to kind of update the prior with the kind of simulated data that we have from R. Um, and JAGS and STAN have both been designed to kind of interface with R, so you don't actually ever need to kind of go into that program, you just call it directly from R. OK, so um, and I'm now just going to move into my first kind of example. Um, so this is a dose finding study for distress management. Um, so as I said, I work at a children's hospital, so both these examples are going to be um, 
kind of in pediatrics and they're specifically going to be in the um, accident and emergency department. So they're for children who kind of come in with injuries um, to the emergency department and um, how we kind of treat those patients. Um, so lacerations are common injuries in the pediatric um, accident and emergency department. So a laceration is um, a <laughs> Uh, just means like a like a cut, like a really bad cut. So like if it was like a knife wound or something that maybe needs stitches. Um, so younger children, unsurprisingly, I think old people um, are often distressed when they have these lacerations. So obviously they've cut themselves. They're probably pretty scared. They've had to be rushed to the hospital. Um, and then what they need is stitches. So they need to stay still. They need to um, and have their kind of laceration repaired. Um, and especially um, young children, they can be crying, they can be, you know, like flailing their arms. And so it's actually can be very difficult for the doctor to do this laceration repair, which can affect outcomes. Um, so intranasal dexamethotomidine, which we're going to call IND, um, gives pain relief and sedation that can reduce the pain and distress in children. So essentially you like minimally sedate the child so that they're kind of relaxed. Um, and you can complete the laceration repair without um, having to, to kind of restrain the child, which is obviously stressful for the child, but also for the parents. Um, the problem is, is that we don't actually know the optimal dose of this intranasal dexamethotomidine. Um, and so we need to find um, a, the best dose. And this dose needs to balance the effective distress management, so kind of calming the child down. But also we really need to balance the potential for over sedation. So imagine you accidentally give the child too much and then they kind of kind of it can be relatively dangerous. They can have breathing issues and stuff like that. So for something that's trying to like make it easier, you could potentially have over sedation, which can be dangerous for the child. So um, there's a this is a, a Bayesian. Um, it's called the Bayesian continual reassessment method, and it's a standard kind of adaptive trial for trying to determine um, the, uh, the best dose. Um, so what you have um, on the right hand side is I have um, the four doses that we're considering in this trial, one uh, microgram per kilogram, two per kilogram, et cetera. And on the um, left hand side, I have a graph which basically gives you the probability of a kind of um, a toxic event, so the probability of over sedation by the different doses. Um, so what we do in a Bayesian continual reassessment method is we start with a prior for the dose response curve. So that's what I've plotted on the left hand side. So you can see that we've got this curve that increases the probability of a toxic event increases as um, the dose increases. But the, the pink dash lines here are the 95% interval. So we have this very wide interval where the probability of a toxic event goes all the way from 0 to 0.7 in the 4 micrograms per kilogram um, group. Um, and so what we do in a Bayesian continual reassessment method is we start by just giving 1 microgram per kilogram to 3 patients. Um, and then we use a Bayesian method to update the data in our trial. Um, from the patients who got the one microgram per kilogram, we basically count how many toxic events they are, and we use that to update the dose response curve. So following that, what we do is we get a reduction in the uncertainty, and we also get a change, a slight change in the shape based on the data that we have. And we then give the drug to the kind of predicted optimal dose um, based on that dose response curve. So in this case, it was three micrograms per kilogram. Um, and that gives us obviously more data, which we use to update the, the, the distribution of the dose response curve. And we keep going. So at that point, we still thought that the best treatment was three micrograms per kilogram. But because we had an event in that kind of those three patients that we did, we then move back to two and we kind of de-escalate. And you keep going forward and you're getting better and better information about the dose response curves. So you can see that the, the pink lines are getting closer and closer to the blue line. Um, and we keep kind of giving our doses to different um, patients depending on what the predicted best dose is. And as we go 
Um, further, we get to a point where actually, based on the accumulating data from the study that we've kind of used to work out which patients should be given which doses, we eventually end up with a much, lots of really good information about the dose response curve. And we now have evidence about which treatment is, which dose is the best. So in this case, it would have been two micrograms per kilogram because that was the dose that we kind of ended up at after we'd gone through all of the process. Um, so for our specific trial, um, what we actually did is we had um, a really a flexible model for this dose response curve, um, which is based on the hyperbolic tangent, um, which I've given uh, the curve there. So essentially we have this kind of curve, but it's a really flexible curve. So it can be um, the curve that we saw the other way. So it can be um, kind of inflected and um, like curving that way and curving the other way. Um, and essentially what we do is we specify this DI vector, which controls the prior mean. So that basically says before we collect any data, what do we think is the probability of a toxic event at each of the doses that we're going to use in our, in our study? That's what we put as DI. And then we use the A, which we start as being an exponential distribution with parameter one. And that A is basically what controls the uncertainty in our distribution. So we start by putting the mean curve and the uncertainty, and then we update that um, going forward. Um, so in this particular study, we used two dose response curves, one for over sedation. So the toxic event in that case was being over sedated and one for under sedation, so where the patient is still really distressed because they weren't able to, um, because they, they didn't have enough um, pain relief and sedation, so they were really kind of stressed and they weren't able to complete the repair. Um, and then we used a multinomial model, um, so that basically gives you the probability of being under sedated, adequately sedated and over sedated. Um, where the, the under sedation and over sedation are both estimated by these dose response curves and the adequate sedation is kind of what we're hoping to achieve. And our aim in the trial is to select the dose that allows 80% of the individuals to be adequately sedated. Um, so to put this into R, um, or in this case, we're putting it into a, into a JAGS model, so a Bayesian model, um, what we had to define um, firstly was the number of individuals who um, were seen in each dose category, in each sedation category for each dose. So this is what we called this data. So data was a um, a matrix that can that was a four by four matrix. The first three columns are the number of people who are under sedated, adequately sedated and over sedated respectively. And the fourth column was the number of individuals receiving each dose. And then the four um, rows are each dose. So one micrograms per ki kilo, two, three and four. Um, and so we start by just defining the number of sedated individuals in each category for each dose and then the number receiving each dose. So at the beginning of the trial, you would have three patients um, for dose one and no patients in the other three categories. So you'd have no information in those categories. We then have to define, as I said, the prior mean. So our kind of expected probabilities of under sedation and over sedation. So in this case, those are the kind of um, vectors that you see in the middle. So for un under sedation, we initially thought that there was a 40% chance of under sedation for dose one, 20% for dose two, 5% for dose three, and 1% for dose four. And for over sedation, it was kind of the opposite. So we thought there was a 1% chance of over sedation for dose one, 5% for dose two, 10% for dose three, and 25% for dose four. So that was based on kind of expert um, opinion and from the literature. And then to define our kind of multinomial model with these two dose response curves, um, we start by just iterating over the four doses. So in this case, we're going uh, for I in the four different doses that we have. Um, S, which was our data, we're talking about the ith row of the data in this point. And we're saying that it has a multinomial distribution. 
with a um, RESP, which is the, the probability vector for, um, for the different probabilities in our multinomial distribution. So you can see that it's one to three. So it has three um, elements, which is under sedation, adequate sedation and over sedation. And then we have N, um, which is the number of individuals that received each dose. And so the I, again, is an iteration over the dose. Um, and then we define our, um, our rest um, vector using the um, arc, the tangent function, which is the tan H. And in this case, we're just selecting again, dose one I. So we're selecting the probability from the, the ith probability for the ith dose. Um, and similarly, and then we define the probability of adequate sedation as one minus the probability of under minus probability of over sedation. And then finally, in this uh, second part here, we have the priors. So where we said it was an exponential distribution with parameter one. Um, so for anybody who hasn't done um, Bayesian statistics before, it's very similar in terms of how you specify the model in R. The only difference is that we use this like tilde, which basically instead of saying that S is kind of a multinomial distribution, tilde basically is saying it's distributed as a multinomial distribution. So again, A1 is distributed as an exponential rather than like is an exponential. Um, so to simulate the study, um, what we actually do is we um, said that this study was aiming to enroll 55 participants with a reassessment every three participants. So you're thinking about simulating the study. What that means is that we simulate three patients or three participants, and then we update our model. So our Bayesian model using the code um, from the previous slide, and then we enroll three more participants and then we update the model. So Every time we simulate the study, we're actually doing like um, close to 20 kind of Bayesian model updates. Um, and we took the following probabilities in our simulation study. So what this means is that the underlying like probability of under sedation, adequate sedation and over sedation that we simulate the data from is uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so we say there's no chance of over sedation in do dose one. Um, and then the best dose is actually dose three, where we have a probability of adequate sedation of 0.85. Um, in this study, we simulated five th 500 trials, so 500 times that we kind of did this adaptive design, with 1,500 simulations from the posterior for each update. So if you imagine that um, I said we had about 20 um, kind of posterior updates in the trial, we're doing 1,500 simulations times 20 times the number of trials, which is about 13.5 million simulations in R. Um, and we found um, that this, this takes a little bit of time, which is why we have relatively small number of trials. But we observed that we had about an 80% chance of determining that dose three was optimal, given the kind of um, the thing that we started with, which is that dose three is optimal. Um, so just to have a little um, bit of an idea of, of what that means and how we how we kind of do that in R. So we're running um, a simulation. So in this case, we're running um, over J um, simulations. So from, in this case, sim was 500. So we're running 500 simulations. Um, and we start with the total number of people randomized each dose as zero on kind of, or the total number of people who receive each dose is zero for each of the doses. And then we start by giving three patients dose one. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're creating um, X, which is the number of people who experience each event for each dose. And then this is what we now do is we have to kind of iterate over the within each trial. So iterate over the interim analyses where total is the num is 55. So the number of patients that we have in the trial and we iterate over each interim analysis. And we then have to um, simulate the data for each dose. So you can see already that this is getting very like 
complex in terms of the nesting. So we have J, I and S. Um, so the data for each of the four treatments, we generate it as the previous number of people who um, received those treatments. Plus the number of people who get under sedated, over sedated and adequately sedated based on the number of people that are randomized to each treatment at each time point. And then we get the total number of um, people is the total, the total number of people who receive each dose is the total from before plus the number who received it at this iteration. We then update the model, um, which is in a bespoke function that I wrote in order to kind of update the model efficiently. And then we work out which is the um, best treatment to, to randomize people to or to give in the next iteration. And then we update the vector that tells you how many people are um, given each treatment in the next iteration. And then finally, we save the total number of people that are randomized to each dose. And we use that to work out that there are 80% of people who get randomized to 80% chance that dose three is the one that people get given the most and that therefore that's the best um, dose to go forward. Um, so just to, as a kind of, oh, yes. Um, so I think there's a, um, people are after a little bit of information about um, uh, transitioning from kind of actual care to the simulation, I think. So okay, yeah. Someone said, uh, do you choose patients on what is most informative for the study or what's most likely best for the patient as these presumably don't always match? So I'm presuming the actual clinical care that people receive is is almost solely clinically driven, but then you you would, I suppose, know what dose they were given and that would then feed into your model. Yeah, so actually um, in this particular case, what happens is patients will arrive at, so the current standard of care is that they don't receive this intranasal dexmedetomidine. Um, and so what will happen is they'll arrive at the emergency department and if they have um, if they have the clinical characteristics that allow them to enroll in this study, um, they'll basically be invited to enroll in the study. So the parents will be given the like risks and benefits and they'll be asked um, whether they think whether they're happy to kind of have their, their child enrolled in this study. Um, and if they are, then they will be given the dose that is kind of specified in this model. So, so presume that's fairly stressful at the time if they're being approached by researchers when their child is free care. Is that, is that the way that it would work? Yeah, yeah. So I think it, so um, I don't do very much on this side of it um, because that tends to be what my clinical colleagues do. Um, but what they actually have is this study is taking part in, um, they have like research intensive um, emergency departments. So at SickKids, as you come into the emergency department, there's a thing that says, you know, you may be approached for research studies because this is a research intensive hospital. And we, you know, believe that this will improve the care for everybody. Um, and they then get approached by research nurses who are essentially trained in kind of approaching people in the emergency department. So obviously they have sensitive, you know, like sensitivity to the situation. Um, and I think there is a relatively high refusal rate um, in clinical trials in general. Um, so I think in pediatric trials, it's something like 50% will refuse to even be screened for the study. Um, so it, it, it is stressful. Um, and I think, but, but they try as much as they can to like mitigate that. And often research is undertaken with um, patient partners. So pair, typically in pediatrics, that would be a parent who has been approached for a research study and then got really interested in research. And so they often help to kind of design the strategy for approaching the parents. Yeah. So uh, there's a couple more questions. I think one is from me, which I think fits in at this point, and then there's another one. Um, you mentioned obviously um, kind of not overdosing, but over what well, come what the words were. Like under, yeah, uh, optimum and over yeah sedation. How do you define under kind of optimum sedation? Where I suppose the the outcome there is that the child is more difficult to treat because they're in more levels of pain and, and therefore more mobile. 
Yeah, so actually this is almost on this slide. So I didn't I didn't touch on this, but we have a, me a measure which is called the pediatric state sedation scale or PSSS. And I don't quite remember <laughs> that, but it's basically a six point scale. So zero to one, two to three, four to five. Um, and I say like over sedation is um, zero to one and it's defined it's defined by like the characteristics of the patient so i think over sed under sedation is defined as like the patient cries out or the patient like actively resists repair um and and things like that so it what they basically do is they actually film the patient while they're being treated um, and then those videos are being are sent off to an independent um, adjudicator, essentially, who watches the video um, and then marks at each like 10 second interval whether the patient is um, crying out, whether the patient is calm. And, and it's like five different like categories that they basically have to tick. And then that gives them the score over the video. And then I think they take I believe they take the most frequent score or something like that, but I uh, I would have to check with the clinician. <laughs> no, that yeah, that um, that makes more sense in my, in my head. So then I presume, I presume the over sedation is based on the number of adverse outcomes, or is that also due to the PSS? Yeah, it's it's to do with the PSSS. I think they do also have like it's like PSSS or like requires a nurse to like resuscitate you know like they do have this kind of catch-all that's like if this was a really bad outcome it just ne naturally goes in over sedation but the, the the PSSS score is one of, to my understanding is one of the most comprehensive scores in terms of including those adverse outcomes in this the scale itself okay and then just one final question um from anonymous actually uh is the Bayesian CRM uh thing telling you which dose uh, to try next in, in order to get the maximum amount of information for that measure or is it kind of guiding the next step so it guides the next step um but it doesn't aim to give you the most information because it i think in order to get the most information what you should actually do probably is pretty much give like 25 percent to each dose but obviously like if the dose number four just over sedated everybody that's really dangerous so it tries to find the best dose that balances over and under sedation. So essentially what I what you can you can you can put a risk tolerance for over sedation into your um, CRM. Um, so in in cancer, which was where this was typically designed, um, when they talk about toxic event, they often say they want to find the best dose subject to like a 20% chance of a toxic event. In over sedation, we tried to be a little bit more cautious about that because we really didn't want to kind of over sedate our patients in the emergency department. So I think we said um, we wanted a 20% chance of adequate sedation, which obviously is then split the, the sorry, we wanted an 80% chance of adequate sedation. So which is obviously split between under and over sedation. Um, and that seemed to be something that kind of balanced that risk of over sedation because we do kind of have this unbalanced thing where, to be honest, we'd rather have people under sedated than over sedated. Yeah. OK, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, that's all of them for now, but I'll, I'll pop back up when any more. <laughs> OK, fantastic. Um, OK, so this was just actually one of the really great things about using R. So. Um, one of the difficulties of doing, I guess, adaptive trials is that you often require the statistician. So if you can think about this CRM, we're actually um, giving the patient. Um, sorry, we're actually <laughs> um, updating the distribution every three patients. So if you think about, you know, this being a statistician, like I'm actually not based at the site where they're doing this study. So what they would have to do is every three patients, they'd have to send me the data and then send, I'd send the data back to them and tell them what the next dose is, which obviously leads to a big lag. What if I'm busy that week? Um, that kind of thing. So what I developed was a um, an online tool using Shiny, um, which basically allowed them to put in the numbers. So the number of patients that were under 
adequately and over sedated respectively for all four doses. And then I just had a button that runs the Bayesian model in the background and calculates the next dose for them. And then actually, it, if you look at the bottom of the text there, it says the following three participants should then be investigated at. And when they calculate the next dose, it just gives them the next dose that they need to use. Um, and so this means that this study has actually been running without my kind of direct access to the data every every three patients. And I think they're at um, like 45 patients now or something. So they're going to finish pretty soon. And they really this tool has been I've had really, really good like kind of discussions about this tool with the team and they're really enjoying that they can kind of do all of this kind of adaptive um, stuff on their own without having to kind of come back to me and waste time waiting for my responses. Um, so what's kind of cool, I guess, is that using Shiny really allows you to kind of do these adaptive designs in a little bit of an easier way. So I see <laughs> that I've been talking too much about Bayesian CRM and uh, I'm only on slide 14. I don't really know how this has happened. Um, so I do actually have another adaptive design. Um, so what I'll do is I'll try to give you a little bit of a flavor of this in like the next 10 minutes, but I won't go through the R code um, of what we did, but you can just see kind of how you can take the relatively simple situation that we had in the, the Bayesian CRM and expand, expand it to a much more kind of complex trial. Um, so this again is in the pediatric emergency department, but it's related to fractures um, and fractures are actually one of the most common reasons to visit the pediatric emergency department. And what they often do um, is something called a fracture reduction. Now, I think this is one of the grossest things that, that there is, but essentially a fracture reduction is when the bone is like out of position. And what they need to do is they need to put it back in position. So sometimes you need surgery. So you go off and you have surgery, but sometimes the bone is only like a little bit out of um, position. So what they actually do is they just kind of like push it back into place. Um, now, I'm sure if there was a clinical person here, they wouldn't say it was pushing it. But yeah, essentially, so they manually kind of manipulate the bone so that it goes back into position. And if it needs pinning, obviously they, they can't do that. But if they think that it will just kind of rest once it's been pushed back into place and then casted, um, that's what they do, because obviously it um, reduces the amount of uh, surgery that's needed. Um, but unsurprisingly, this is painful <laughs> and um, the children need to be sedated. So the most common sedation in this setting is intravenous ketamine. Um, so yeah, an IV goes into the hand and they give them ketamine through a bowl. But again, the problem with this is that intravenous, like IV insertion in children is very scary. Like they often rate it as like as painful or more painful than the injury itself. Um, and it's actually very difficult because they have small veins, so it's difficult to do. Um, so they would much prefer to have like an intranasal. So basically where they like snort it up their nose um, way of doing this. Um, but the problem with that is that essentially the amount of ketamine that you get in your system is less um, intranasally than it is in the IV. Um, so it can be quite difficult. Um, but uh, using the same drug as before, so dexamethotomidine, if you can combine, potentially combining ketamine and dexamethotomidine allows them to kind of act together and get like better efficacy. So it could be a potential alternative. Um, and so the goal of this trial, um, which we called the Ketodex trial, was firstly to determine whether intranasal Ketodex was non-inferior to IV ketamine. So essentially intranasal drugs are preferred to IV drugs. So if we could determine that IN ketodex was pretty much the same, that would be good. Um, and in fact, in standard practice, what would probably happen is you'd have intranasal ketodex. And if that didn't work, you would then move to IV ketamine. So you can actually, um, you know, we, we actually have quite a lot of tolerance in terms of non-inferior because there is an opportunity to kind of go to the to the kind of standard of care at the moment. But we weren't actually sure prior to that what the optimal dose combination of IN ketodex was. Um, so we actually needed to determine the optimal dose combination at the same time as determining whether the optimal was non-inferior to IV ketamine. 
So what we were using was a novel, like seamless phase two, three design, which basically did the optimal dose combination and the comparative effectiveness analysis in the same study. So this combined a lot of different, like um, a lot of different uh, kind of adaptive concepts. So the first one was adaptive randomization. So what we did was we started with a equal randomization between the three um, IN ketid X doses that we had. And then as we go through the study, we as we get more data, we basically update and we um, randomize patients, more patients to the drug combinations that are more effective. And what this does, is it allows us to get more information on the effective dose combinations um, and use those to kind of bring forward into the comparative effectiveness analysis. So we actually have enough data to compare between the best dose and placebo. So in this case, oh sorry, it's not placebo, it's IV ketamine. So R0 is basically the, um, the section where we're giving um, IV ketamine and the top R1 is where we're giving um, the dose combinations. So then what we did in the in the kind of final analysis portion, which I guess is the right hand side of the figure, is we actually used dose response modeling. So all of the data from all of the patients, irrespective of which dose they took, basically goes into the dose response modeling and through that goes into the comparative effectiveness analysis. So we're maximizing the use of the data in the trial. Um, and basically what we did in the dose response modeling is we choose the treatment with the highest efficacy. And then we take that forward and we compare the dose with the highest efficacy with the, with the IV ketamine. And we calculate the difference between um, those two. So we get a posterior distribution for the difference between the effectiveness of the best dose and the effectiveness of IV ketamine. And then we calculate the probability that that difference is below some threshold. And the reason we use a threshold here is because we're doing a non-inferiority trial. So we're trying to work out whether the um, IN ketodex is like not much worse than IV ketamine. And then we finally, we had kind of three conclusions of our trial. Um, that the ketodex was non-inferior, that we had an inconclusive trial, so we needed more evidence, or that IV ketamine was superior. So we have these thresholds, lambda one and lambda two, which basically say, is iron ketodex non-inferior or IV ketamine superior? Um, so in terms of the simulations that we run, um, to implement the ketodex design, what we actually needed to determine in these simulations was the overall sample size, the threshold for dropping dose combinations from the adaptive randomization. So if you look um, in the adaptive randomization section, there are two kind of time periods where we don't randomize people to the worst dose. And that's because um, the probability of that being the best dose is so low that we want to kind of stop people from getting that drug just because it it's there's very little evidence of it being effective. And um, so we need to determine that threshold. We need to determine the threshold for concluding that ketodex is non-inferior, the threshold for concluding that ketamine is superior. And we also need to understand the size and the power of the study. So that's the type one and the type two error of the study. And we run all of those simulations. So those five different simulations to work out those different criteria in R and JAGS to determine the values. Um, so for the sample size, we ran um, something which is called the average length criterion, and we found out that the sample size is 410 participants with 40% of them randomized to IV ketamine. Um, and then in terms of the decision thresholds um, that, we, that we chose, we dropped treatments from a given trial phase if the probability of being an optimal treatment drops below 5%. And we had an 83% chance of selecting the right optimal treatment. We then um, chose that IN ketodex is non-inferior if the probability that um, it's superior drops below 4.54%. And we conclude the superiority of IV ketamine if the probability of its superiority is above 62%. And an inconclusive trial will be declared between those two values.
Um, so what we found here, um, just to give you an idea, is that based on our previous data, scenario six um, is kind of the null um, scenario. So where um, heated X is like just non-inferior. And in that case, we have a 5% chance of non-inferiority. So that's the kind of standard type one error that we have. Um, and then we also fixed it so that if um, keto dex was uh, the probability of a successful sedation under keto dex was 78%, then we had a 50% chance of concluding that IV ketamine was superior. Um, and in this case, in our kind of scenarios for like relatively so these top scenarios are basically the most likely values for the probability of um success under iv in ketid x and in that case we have really high probabilities of concluding non-inferiority at like greater than 99 percent 93 percent and uh, we have an 84 percent chance of um correctly choosing the optimal treatment and concluding non-inferiority so I ran these simulations in R, which I won't go through. Um, so just to give you some quick conclusions. So adaptive clinical trials can be more efficient, ethical and informative than fixed designs, but they require statistical expertise in both the design and the analysis phases to assure that these advantages are realized. Simulation methods are usually required to ensure that these designs reach their potential. And these simulations can be undertaken in R and which allows you to interface with common Bayesian software and kind of use Bayesian methods in your trials. Um, and R Shiny um, can be used to create user interfaces that support researchers during the trial and can actually reduce the burden on statisticians while the trial is ongoing. Um, so there are um, a few references here um, and I will happily take <laughs> any final um, questions. Thank you. Um, there, there aren't a lot of the many questions. I think a lot of people are probably st like like I am uh, trying to take as much in as possible. Um, so it might be worth. I saw that you had your your um, email on the second slide. There, it might be worth um, providing some information as to how people could either do some further reading on your work or get in touch with yourself. Um, but there is one question um, from Mohammed who asks, uh, why did you choose R? Um, and also, what were the data science challenges? So I suppose it may also be worth giving us a little information about your, I suppose your kind of journey with R and, and kind of where you, when you started it, what you were doing and how how long you took from to get to start to where you are now, essentially. Yeah, OK, um, so. OK, so the first question, I guess, like why R? <clears throat> so I think it's really, I find it really flexible. So um, like, especially with the interface with the Bayesian software, like I find that that's really helpful. And um, that tends to be at least the, the interface that I've kind of found the easiest. I know that some paid for softwares do have some kind of Bayesian like modules within them, but they're often not as, at least to my understanding, they're not as flexible. So it can be a bit of a challenge to, to do that. Um, but I think my R story probably tells you more why R than anything else. So I am, um, I R is almost the only software that I've re ever really used. So I did a little bit of SAS during my um, undergraduate degree, but when I um, mostly even then I was working in R. Um, then I when I started my PhD, um, almost all of my um, work was in R. Um, so some of it was simulation based, so I find that you can run pretty efficient simulations in R. Um, but I also um, did a lot of like uh, coding, so trying to develop functions to make it easier for people to use the methods that I worked on. Um, so that was that kind of thing. So I guess I started using R in maybe the second year of my undergraduate, which <laughs> was probably coming up to 10 years ago now, um, but it wasn't really until I started my PhD that I really realized, I guess, the flexibility and the versatility of R. So um, yeah, for like seven years, I've been using it pretty much as my main software of, of doing my work. Um, and some of that is um, analysis. So, you know, getting the data sets from the trials and doing the analysis. 
but primarily it's been running simulation studies and um, yeah, coding up functions. Um, I've never really had much for like formal training in R, and I find that the really great thing about R is that because there's so much help online, um, you can really kind of learn as and when you as and when you need the next like piece. So it becomes something that you learn by doing. Um, and you know, I think that that's a strength, but it can also be a weakness because sometimes you find you know five years later that there was a much faster way of doing of doing the thing that you, that you were doing. So for example, often when I'm running simulations, I need to calculate means. Um, and I found that um, if you do like sum X over length X, that can actually save you like 10% on the speed of your simulation when you're calculating, say, 13.5 million means. Um, so things like that um, can be kind of interesting as well. Like as you get more kind of confident with R, you can you can improve and you can optimize. And I think doing simulations often is something that forces you to optimize. Um, I've certainly had situations where I calculated and I was like, oh, this simulation will take 5,000 days. Better find a way to make it more efficient. Um, so a lot of my kind of efficiency has come by necessity. Yeah, that sounds um, equally satisfying and frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> As go along. Um, there's one question from um, Jason Pott who said, said firstly it was a really interesting talk. Um, how do the um, how do the research sponsor how does the research sponsor deal with the shiny app as a um, data collection CRF? That make any sense to you? Um, yeah, so <laughs> great, great question. Um, so actually I haven't had any um, any issues with it and I think it's because um, what they actually are putting in the the shiny is the they're not collecting the data in the shiny so they collect the data in red cap and then they um, they just put the counts so it's not even like they upload any like patient data it's just the counts for each of those sections um, I think Jason followed up as well, as well saying that they uh, they often have to have robust validation on their research databases. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, was, yeah I, I haven't had any issues like they the, the team have been using it very happily, but maybe they just maybe <laughs> this is going to go online now. But yeah, I, they, they haven't had any issues with it. I, I just personally as um, as a kind of relative to you fairly novice R user, I was quite um, taken by the fact that the the research nurses and, and the kind of the actual clinicians were being guided by the the next dosages to provide based on your shiny output is that correct yeah yeah so that's yeah so that's what's happening so i believe the workflow is that the nurses um and the data entries enter it into the database and then the research assistant on the project or the, the research associate on the project um downloads the data and then yeah puts it you know into the format that it needs to just be entered into those cells and then they just enter into that cell and press calculate yeah so what was your what was your process of um i suppose kind of qa and, and in, like in, ensuring kind of fail safes were were in place to because i suppose you had to provide your your product and your code to then steer clinical practice very kind of directly so that was a, a fairly daunting thing perhaps yeah um i think it's yeah, I mean, it's yeah, I, I try to to check my own work. Um, I try to, you know, like I have these simulations, so I try to run through like one of the simulations to check that I got the same result from the code as I did from the Shiny app. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things that's actually really kind of interesting about working in trial design um, is that it's often something that has to be done like quite quickly um, because you know that they've got the funding in place and they need the design like yesterday um and so as much as possible the the checks that i find are kind of you do it you run it you see you get something that that seems to kind of make sense and then a lot of it um the code is often very messy it's very like 
<laughs> you know, not great. And then as you go forward and you're kind of refining it either for publication or for presentation, but also, you know, just to like check and, and submit for REB and things like that, you, you kind of refine the code and you copy it over and you comment it much better. And so I found that actually that process of just you have it and it makes sense and it kind of aligns with the literature and then moving it over so that it's much it can be easily shared um was the main like i guess quality assurance part that i did um yeah <laughs> i think maybe there's less yeah i don't know no that's good thank you um i think that's all of our questions at the moment um, Charlotte has put a little link in the chat inviting anyone uh, who's still here to to um, follow the Mentimeter. Um, let me just take the screen again. Just to remind everybody um, about our up and coming events. Um, as I mentioned, do get in touch with us via our various um, social media and um, the email address that Charlotte's posted there to give any feedback um, or we can forward any questions to Anna if, if you have any or you're kind of searching for any further reading. Um, but I think unless Anna, you're happy for us to call it a day? Yes, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been really, uh, it's been really great to, to present to you and I hope it's been interesting. I hope it was about the right level. Um, this is yeah. kind of work for me. It's the first time I presented it, so I think you might have noticed I <laughs> didn't get the pacing quite right. But um, yeah, really, uh, um, yeah, I hope it was interesting and a, a different way of using R than maybe you've seen before. Yeah, it was definitely that. Yeah, um, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Mohammed or somebody else gets in touch with you to perhaps be in, involved a bit further, especially with the R conference coming up. But um, for now, thanks for thanks for doing that, and I'll uh, I'll end this session. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Have a great day <laughs> or afternoon. <laughs>